Hi, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. My name is David Robson. I'm a horticulturalist and pesticide specialist with the University of Illinois, and your host today, helping you learn how to garden correctly. We're gonna take your questions. We have some emails. We have some show and tells by our panelists. So let's get started. And our first panelist, Chuck Voigt. Chuck. Hi, I'm Chuck Voigt. I'm in the crop sciences department here on the University of Illinois campus. My specialties are vegetables and herbs. So questions along those lines would, would be appropriate. Uh, I had an experience that I've had many times over the past many years. A, a nice young woman came in and was really concerned because she had these little green tomatoes growing on the top of her potato plants. I was able to set her mind at ease because they're just the potato fruits. Potatoes, tomatoes in the same nightshade family, their fruits look a lot alike. Uh, it, it really is, is not uh, any, any big deal. You know, they get big clusters of flowers. This one I think is, is unusual because I've never seen 10 in a cluster before. Uh, so it, it's, it's very good. They, they don't happen every year. Uh, some varieties are more likely to get them than others. Uh, they do have seeds inside. So if you wanted to become a, a potato breeder, uh, you could take those. There's going to be variation among them. Uh, grow them out and, and you know, grow a few thousand and then maybe you'll, you'll have the next <laughs> great, great potato. Luther Burbank, the great plant breeder, started that. I uh, grew 23 of them from a single one of these fruits. One of them was a long white with, with very dry, uh, flaky flesh. Uh, it later mutated a, a russet skin and became the, uh, the, uh, the potato of, of the 20th century. Great, so there's the potential for the new potato of the 21st century, <coughs> possibly there or in You're somebody's sitting on garden. This table, right? You too can be a potato breeder if you really, <laughs> really, really want to. But it would be frustrating because I have 27 varieties in my potato patch and just looking around quickly, I, I can only find maybe four or five in the whole, in the whole group. So the conditions have to be just right and you have to have a variety that's inclined to do it. Great. And you really shouldn't eat those, correct? Right, right, yeah, they, they are nightshades. <laughs> yeah. uh, potato foliage, Don't be it, munching on potato foliage is, is particularly uh, uh, bad, it's got alkaloids in it. And the same thing if you have a potato that's had the sunshine on it, the part that's, that's greened up is gonna have those alkaloids as well, um, so probably not. And th <laughs> that, that's, because they're nightshades was one of the reasons why they didn't eat tomatoes for so long. Mm. Yeah. Um, Correct. The other yeah. one was that they're so red and voluptuous that they were regarded as being a religious. But uh, <laughs> okay, Chuck. I think oh, too what much a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and I was going to say speaking of voluptuous, but I'm going to say <laughs> speaking I know you're of about our, the caterpillar. The caterpillar <laughs> that is that you are holding, Sandy Mason. <laughs> After that, hi, I'm Sandy Mason with the University of Illinois Extension. I'm a horticulture <laughs> educator. And my lovely caterpillar, I have a picture of here. This is actually a polyphemus caterpillar, if you can see him here. Uh, and this was a picture that, uh, this was out actually at the U of I Arboretum. So, and it just about a week or so ago, this was taken. And so I just really encourage people to go out and look for some of the great caterpillars that are out there, because we don't always think about that. Plus, these are uh, some of the great big silk moths. So things like Luna moths, Cecropia moths, as polyphemus is the same one. So these are large caterpillars, you know, six or seven inches. Uh, this is actually a picture of uh, a polyphemus moth that I actually had overwintered because I'd found the little cocoon or the big cocoon at the end of the season over winter. That's, and it was, was just, he was just coming out at that point. And then this is a picture actually one of a female and you can see these wonderful, it's really expanded and you can see these wonderful eyes, these fake eyes and what a great uh, thing this is to scare away predators. So th mm. these silk moths are one of those things that we just don't see like we used to. There's some real problems with them. We just don't see the populations like we used to have. Um, I did want to let people know about the Silk Moths of Illinois book. This is through the Illinois Natural History Survey. Uh, you can actually order this online. And right now it's for sale for $5. $5. A mere $5. Can you believe that? So it's everything from like Cecropias, the Luna Moths, the Polyphemus I just mentioned. So lots of great info about them. Um, 
Um, also, some other great books that they have on also Sphinx moths. You know, we'll see those. Mm -hmm. A number of the people often call them hummingbird moths. As well as there's a new Butterflies of Illinois book. This is only 20 bucks for this book, and it's it's brand new, and it really gives you so much information about what you can see out in your garden, really right now. Once we start getting into the warm season, we'll see more and more butterflies and moths and all that kind of good stuff. So Great. it's really a lot of fun to learn about them. Good. Thank you very much, Sandy. Sure. Our next guest, Steve Still. Steve. Hi. Hi. Glad to be here. I'm Steve Still, as mentioned. I'm a professor emeritus from Ohio State University. Uh, also a, a proud graduate of the University of Illinois for many, many years ago. Uh, I have tonight, well, I want to tell you, my specialty are perennials. So if there are perennial questions out there, we'll be glad to address those. I have a, a question from a viewer in uh, Bensonville who had two shagbark hickory trees in their yard and wants to know how to harvest the fruits, or the nuts in this case, and a few black walnut trees as well. So basically it's a pretty simple a project uh, as a homeowner or in the, the native uh, areas, simply picking them up off the ground is a way to harvest them. In the case of the uh, hickory nuts, typically the husk will fall as they ripen, it will fall apart, so then you just need a, a very large hammer to uh, hammer and break the, the uh, coat of the seed. With the walnuts, we have a, a husk, a fleshy husk on it, and if you harvest those with your hands, you'll end up with black hands at the end of the, the season. <laughs> uh, that is a little bit more difficult. Uh, if you have, if you're going to do a lot of black walnuts, then I suggest uh, finding the old-fashioned uh, corn sheller, where you used to put the ear of corn in and crank it, and it would shell the corn off. Uh, those are great for taking the husk off, and then you crack those. Now, it's interesting with this uh, uh, question because most people with black walnut trees say, "How do I get rid of the, the nuts from <laughs> the ground?" And there's a very neat t tool. It is a round ball of flexible wire, and it looks like uh, the the bingo parlor thing where you spin that, <laughs> and it has a handle on it, and you roll that across, and it just pops those the walnuts into the, the grid, and then you just separate. It's a perfect uh, thing. It's like picking up golf balls on the, the course, <laughs> but uh, black walnuts, in a short period of time, you got rid of all the black walnuts in the grass. Wow. Never heard about one of those things. I can just imagine it though, but it's kind of interesting. Right now, we're gonna to go to our Did You Know video. A native plant of China, rhubarb was grown and traded for medicinal purposes as early as the 16th century. Rhubarb gained popularity as a food and vegetable source by the 19th century. Chuck, any other comments about rhubarb other than I pickled it this year, which is Whoa. interesting, um, but any specific things you want to say about rhubarb um, as our resident vegetable specialist? As we get later in the summer, it would be the time to, a time to, to dig it up and divide it and move it. The other time would be in the spring when you can just first see it coming up. Um, uh, it, it's probably having a little bit of a rough time uh, this this summer because of all the moisture we're having in, in this part of the world, um, but hopefully it will it will survive and and uh, come back strong again next year. Yeah, I noticed a lot of mine have uh, yellow leaves where they're just wilt. Mm -hmm. They turn just, yellow and then they kind of yeah. wilt and fall over. But picking them out doesn't. It's not the whole clump, and so it seems well, like they're going to do okay. In, in, in midsummer, kind of, the leaves tend to go down yeah. anyway, and then they come up back a little bit in the fall, maybe or maybe not, and then they seem to to be pretty tough. So unless they're standing underwater, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think the only thing which I, I had yeah. some garden area that was doing that. <laughs> but, I remember years and years ago when we first started, uh, I learned that termites go after the rhubarb crown when it starts getting really woody below the ground. And if it starts yeah. dying, dig it up, you can find termites. I was just shocked. Uh, little things you learn from this show. Wow. <laughs> Lots of little things. <laughs> with that, we're going to go to line six and Gloria with a question about lilac leaves. Hi. Hello. Hi. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I have a lilac bush and a sweet gum tree about 150 feet apart. They both have almost all their leaves turning brown, and part of them are completely brown and getting crunchy. 
I'm wondering if it's from too much water. They are not standing in water, but we've had an awful lot of water. Thoughts? Yeah, I don't know. Are there any kind of like spots on the leaves or anything like that that you've noticed or anything that might indicate like a fungal leaf disease or something like that? Um, and, that and we have other trees and none of them are showing it yet. Yeah. And they're way far apart. Hmm. I would... I wouldn't think it'd be too much water, or the symptoms would probably be more of a paling of the the leaves before they would go brown. But uh, and they would, typically they would just kind of stay on the plant and just be carotid through the summer period. Uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of wondering about that too. You know, the lilacs get bores and a lot yeah. of diseases, but I can't imagine what would be affecting the sweet gum yeah. tree at the same yeah. time. I, I, I would almost bet it's two different things that we're talking about, unless it truly is a wet area, because right. we're not going to see something infectious that's probably going to, yeah, that I can think of, that's going to do lilac and sweet gum both. So. I've kind of seen some of that happening, and mm -hmm. I think it's just the extreme wetness and the, and the, and the unrelentingness of the wetness. Mm -hmm. um, even if it's not standing in water, you know, you get, you know, two inches of rain and then another inch later in the week and then three or four the following week. <laughs> it's just... It, the, the aeration of the soil is, is not what it should be, and, and I think the leaves are cutting, the, or the plants are cutting their losses and, and cutting down how many leaves they're trying to, to maintain. And, and, I, and I think the other thing that I would just check is, that it, does it seem like the branches are actually dying, or is it just the leaves? Because sometimes we'll see some leaf issues, mm -hmm. but the branch itself, if you just take your thumbnail and kind of scratch mm -hmm. the branch a little bit on where the leaves mm -hmm. have actually fallen off, sometimes you can see that the branch is still perfectly alive, and sometimes they'll go ahead and re-leaf. If they're truly dying back, then there might be something a little bit more with maybe way too, too wet, the roots are really mm -hmm. wet and rotting, or something like that. So I think that would be another thing to check, see if the stems are actually dying back. Great. Thank you. Well, our next call is line three. Rick with a tomato problem. Rick. Rick, are you there? He's looking at the tomatoes. Rick. Okay, let's move on to Elizabeth on line four with a question about roses. Elizabeth. Elizabeth, line four. Elizabeth? Maybe Elizabeth's talking to Rick. Okay, maybe Rick <laughs> and Elizabeth are talking. Okay, um, well, while we're getting those and getting, why don't yeah. we move on to some more of your emails that okay. you have? Okay, uh, this is a question. Uh, this person, Paul, has a, a sage plant. Uh, it has dried leaves on it, uh, and they're from last year, and he's wondering if he could still use those. And I'd say, you know, Smell them if, if they don't smell moldy or otherwise uh, off. You probably could. The fresh ones are probably going to be better. Uh, this, this is a, a fairly old question. It's from back in May. Uh, he also wants to prune the bush back. And when and how should you do that? Um, as a sage plant comes out of winter, uh, look at it. And anything that's dead, take that out. And then make a decision. Do you want your sage plant to flower a lot? Or do you want it to have lots and lots of vegetative growth that you use to cook with and, and dry and do those things with? And the, then from there, if you want the flowers, you know, maybe just shape it up a little bit uh, so that it, it you know, has a nice uh, pleasing uh, outline and let it go. It'll flower a lot. If you want lots of vegetative growth, cut it back hard and it will, it will flush back out and you'll have mainly leaves that you can, that you can use and, and do things with. Um, at, at this point, we're kind of halfway through the season. Uh, it, it should have some vegetative growth. You can harvest that uh, fairly heavily, you know, up to a third of the foliage. Uh, and you can do that up until probably about Labor Day. And then after Labor Day, you want to cut back, not, not cut back, you want to stop that. Uh, don't take much off after that because it can damage the winter hardiness of the plant. Um, are we going to see, with all of the rain, the moisture, are we going to see the quality of the herbs <sighs> differ somewhat? You know, people think that it, that it gets diluted, and, and maybe it does. The, the question I would have is because of all this dark, dank <laughs> weather, they're not getting the heat units that they need mm -hmm. to really you know, manufacture a lot of these things. And I think 
that would be my primary cause if, if, if the flavor is not what it usually is because they're just, they're just not getting the sunshine and the, mm -hmm. and the warmth and those things that, that you know, are the building blocks of, of, of those uh, chemicals that we know and love. Okay, I, I do know that um, uh, basil likes the heat and the sunlight and <laughs> not doing good right now. No, mm -hmm. it's, it's perfect yeah. weather for, the, for basil uh, 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 mildew, the yeah. n not powdery, the other one, downy mildew. Downy which has become a plague the last four or five years. Uh, so I, I can't, it, it's probably going to be a terrible year for that. I think all vegetable crops are suffering. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> don't, even, don't even get me going on my tomato plants. Yeah. And Sandy, you have a vegetable question. I do have a vegetable question, and we get this one quite a bit. And actually, um, uh, Alice had a question, about, well, why are my radishes always hot? And I hear that quite a bit, where people say, why are they hot? And actually, Chuck and I were chatting a little bit about that, and I would think probably the first thing is, don't let them sit in the garden so long. Their radishes are one of the fastest crops. I mean, that's that's the thing I like about them is the fact that, you know, 30, 40 days, they're ready to pick. So don't, or ready to harvest. So don't leave them in the garden too long. Uh, we were also talking about just the heat. Uh, sometimes actually hot summers, if you're, if they're really more of that cool, kind of cooler season crop. So really early in the season, late in the season, not really necessarily the hot part of the summer. And also just to make sure with all of our root crops, just to make sure that you do go ahead and thin them. Um, and I know that's a tough thing to do, but when they're, you know, just crammed in there, sometimes that's a quality issue as well. So make sure you thin them. So that'd be a few things, but yeah. yeah great. Yeah, those, those radish seeds that I use to mark my carrot rows, you know, they're, they're 8 to 12 inches apart. Those things develop so fast that they're the best radishes I ever get because they're not crowded together. Mm -hmm. and, and even better than thinning them is to not plant them as thickly because, <laughs> yeah. because, 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 because by the time you get up to where you're yeah. thinning them, yeah. they've already kind of affected yeah. each other. Good point. Good point. Um, so point. radish seeds germinate really well and, and last pretty well from year to year even. Uh, so I would say hold back a little, don't get carried away putting them in too, too close. So, you know, plant them a radish width apart. Yeah. That's why maybe the strips where you had to seed and lay it down, <laughs> mine are always too thick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Steve, you, you have go. a question on one of our bulbous summer. Yes, I do. This is a, another uh, comment or question from a, a viewer in the northwest suburb of Chicago. Has a crocosmia a flower. Been in several years, a south-facing border, so it should be getting uh, sun there unless there's a shade tree over the top of it. Foliage appears in the spring, uh, but no flowers. What should we do? Is it planted too deep, too shallow? I would say the first thing to look at, make sure it's still full sun, even though it's listed as a south exposure. Fertilize the plant. And another thing to consider, the crocosmia are not our hardiest uh, of bulb. They, uh, uh, and they can uh, be too tender for northern areas. Um, I have them in my yard where at one time it was considered a zone five, it's probably six now, but probably Chicago was a zone five. And unfortunately, if you want to see great crocosmia, you need to go to England. And, uh, <laughs> They're great there as well. A super cultivar is Why Lucifer. is that unfortunate? <laughs> <laughs> I think let's just get a plane and go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But all, we all don't have that money to do yeah, that. That's yeah. true. We all work uh, for a university. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But no, Crocosmia is a great uh, a plant, and uh, I, I would check the, the fertilizer. I don't think the depth is a, a problem with the plant. Good, good. Well, before we get back to our phones, let's go to our mag quiz video. The wisteria in Sierra Madre is said to be the world's largest flowering plant. How many blossoms does it produce yearly? A. 15,000 B. 150,000 C. 1,500,000 D. 2,500,000 C. 1,500,000 The wisteria produces over 1.5 million blooms and has been growing for over 100 years. I don't think I'd want to do the annual pruning on that. Um, and who counts them? That's what I, yeah, I think it's a guess. Who has it's, that job? It's probably a computer program. Oh, okay, just check it. You, you count them, count them in, a, in, a, in a square, <laughs> square meter and then, yeah. and then you guess. Oh, okay. okay, let's go back to the phones. Line two, line four. We have a question on hickory, I believe. No, it's about green peppers. Okay, green peppers. 
they were looking good, and then I noticed the leaves were kind of curling, and the, they've yellowed on the bottom leaves, and those have dropped off. I've noticed little brown spots on the leaves, so I'm wondering what I can do to save those plants. I think we're going to all look down at the other end. <laughs> yeah, for boy, mine look the same way. <laughs> uh, mine are standing in water, so I know why mine look <laughs> that way. Um, and and yours could very well also be suffering from just too much water. It it it's it's just pathetic to see. <laughs> uh, fortunately, I had some left over, so I went ahead and potted them up. So I'm growing them out of the ground. Uh, to try to salvage the end of the season, but uh, there doesn't seem to be an end in sight at this point. How late can we plant them? I, we're probably pushing it. Okay. Um, you know, if you have if you have plants, uh, and and they they would probably be only make like green peppers at this point, as opposed to to the ripe peppers, which is what I really like. Okay. Um, my tomatoes the same way. Uh, <clears throat> The soil has just been saturated too much. Um, uh, nitrogen uh, is going back to the atmosphere. It's leaching out. Uh, it's just it's just a a nasty situation. Okay. Um, if if you can if you can dig them up and 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 plant them on higher ground or plant them in a in a container, <laughs> you might salvage something. But but when um, when it rains constantly, even my, my containers, I've got. Uh, two foot tall peppers, and I've got a a, a foot of bare stem on it. They, yeah. They're just, they're just, yeah. it's just the weather. No well, sun. We got and, no heat. Heat. and it hasn't. And a lot heat. of the time, yeah. it, to this point, it hasn't been warm enough for peppers yeah. as yep. well. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, line two, Margaret with her hickory tree. Hi. Hi, Margaret. I have one hickory tree. It's about three years old. Do I need another one before I can? Uh, get some nuts or it just take a long time it'll take a long time, a long time. one yeah. tree though yeah it right. should be one tree yep but give it another 10 15 20 years <laughs> <laughs> or it just takes a while yeah i planted a hickory nut in 1974 and the first time i saw anything like a nut in the treetop was two years ago so mm -hmm. do the math on that <laughs> that's okay 40 to 50 years. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And, 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 yeah. and we, if, you, if you can believe the catalog, some of the grafted ones will yield in six or seven years, so uh, a seedling maybe isn't the answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Mm -hmm. Line five, Creeping Charlie. Michael, your question? Yes. Uh, yes, how are you tonight? Fine, thank you. Okay, um, I cut my grass, then I, I use a, a sprayer for the, uh, the Creeping Charlie, and it rained a little bit, but not about well, four or five days after I sprayed. And when I came back, just Creeping Charlie, nothing died except maybe some of my grass. So <laughs> how do I get rid of Creeping Charlie? Well, I know I put in a patio and that got rid of it completely because <laughs> I have no grass, but I'm sure you guys I'm have a I'm surprised that it didn't what? find a way up, <laughs> up around the patio. Uh, when they went down, they put in the patio. Yeah. Okay, they put in a yeah. patio. Yeah, so I don't know what herbicide you ended up uh, using. Uh, y usually what we find uh, in order uh, to actually get rid of uh, Creeping Charlie is that you do need to use often some of the um, herbicides that have multiple products in them. Um, and it, what you'll notice sometimes on the label, it'll actually call it ground ivy instead of Creeping Charlie. So sometimes mm -hmm. that's really confusing. So make sure it has ground ivy in the label. And also generally what happens to hap has to happen is you have to do a second application. So read the label when it says you can do a second application in six to eight weeks, you generally need to go ahead and do it. So the first application kind of knocks it down a little bit. I'm a little surprised you didn't get any kind of response. That makes me wonder about what herbicide you used and maybe the rate that you used. So make sure you really read and the, the rain label properly. Might have diluted mm -hmm. it yeah, enough. but you would think after yeah. a few day, you know, after a few days and then it rains. I don't know. And I always want to caution just because of the job that if you are going to use one of the multi chemical products that have several, make sure you read the label mm -hmm. and don't use it around trees or shrubs because some of it can be uptaken and they can do some damage to right, the trees right, and shrubs. Right. So read that label. Really, yeah, yeah, really pay attention to the label. Mm -hmm. And I will say, say, you know, Creeping Charlie, it's green. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's green. Yeah. It's, you know, I, I actually kind of live with it pretty much in the yard. So, you know, from far away, it just looks mm -hmm. green, right? <laughs> At 50 miles an hour, yes. <laughs> At 50 miles an okay, hour. let's go to line three and Helen on her tulip tree. <laughs> Helen. Yes. 
You have a question on your tulip tree. Yes. Um, I have tulip tree. It's just four years old, and it came up nice and out nice and green this year, and then all of a sudden it started dying. And uh, we have a garden club here, I mean a tree committee here in Petersburg, and he stopped and checked it and said there's no mites there, and he dug around the edges of it. He couldn't find anything wrong with it. It's been mm-hmm. dying like this for, oh, probably three weeks, all except one branch. <laughs> one branch stays green. Do we sound like a broken record when we keep talking yeah. about uh, I think, yeah. wet, wet, wet? Just quickly, I'm going to say that it's yeah. water again, probably, and if most of the tree is dead, it's not going to come back. Yeah, yeah. Especially if yeah. somebody looked and make sure that there wasn't like something girdling around the trunk or something girdling around the Or major or sap sucker injury. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another something thing else. To it too. It just so. really makes you wonder. Well, I want to thank the panel for he- being here, and I want to thank you for being here. Stop in again and enjoy us on Mid American Gardener.